Morgan and Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Mel is uh, our Director of Entrepreneurship and um, Innovation here at Macquarie University in the Incubator. Uh, my name is Morgan Popley. I am a program manager here in the incubator and work with our startups and researchers right across the university to deliver programs that help them to build their entrepreneurial capabilities and skills and hopefully commercialize their ideas into really, really successful businesses. Um, we, what we're doing today is a little bit of a partnership between us at the incubator at Macquarie and um, the global entity that is Venture Cafe in delivering um, our leaders, innovators and disruptors uh, event for this month. Now, it's very exciting because we get to do this on um, the start of National Reconciliation Week. And we're very fortunate to have some amazing speakers with us today that can help us discuss some of the themes of the week and how they might play out, particularly in the entrepreneurship um, uh, uh, ecosystem um, that we're currently in. So without further ado, I'll start to work through our very short presentation. Um, and kicking off with our Welcome to Country, uh, which we have from Macquarie University, um, when it loads. Welcome. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of Macquarie University land, the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. We welcome people of all nations and all faiths. Kwai Bidja, Jamna Payala Janawi. Come here, we speak together. We have 60,000 years of archaeological evidence of Aboriginal habitation at Lake Mungo and 20,000 years in Ride. We have great antiquity. Today, hundreds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people graduate from Macquarie University. The Darug Nation had famous leaders such as Chief Yaramundi, Naraginji, Colby and Maria Locke. Many of the descendants of these Darug people live today amongst you. We celebrate with you our ongoing attachment and custodianship of this country. We celebrate the achievements of Macquarie University. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the Macquarie University lands, which is the Watamadigal clan of the Darug nations, whose cultures and customs have nurtured and continue to nurture this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and what we also do like to do here at the incubator is also, particularly when we're on these Zoom sessions, is, is allow the opportunity for um, everyone else who's here today to acknowledge the traditional custodians of your land. And um, uh, so if you'd like to do that in the Zoom chat, please feel free um, to do that now because it's always really interesting to see who we have joining us today online and, and how we're all this one, one big community um, right across this country. And if you're in another country, um, you might like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of your land as well. Um, so to, to oh, I've got a picture here of the, the incubator, so I better talk about that first. So I'm sitting here in the Macquarie University incubator. I mentioned that we are, um, we work with startups and entrepreneurs in the innovation ecosystem here in Macquarie Park. Um, this is a picture of the beautiful building that I'm sitting in today, which is um, just fantastic. So we're very lucky and fortunate uh, to be able to be here. Um, a little bit about us is that you can kind of think of us like the beating heart of innovation and entrepreneurship in the university. So we work with researchers, we work with the community outside of the university, uh, we work with corporate partners as well within the park and, and even further than that. Um, but the big thing is also working with students. So we really bring all of these different segments of that innovation ecosystem together and help build that capability right across um, the university community. Um, and that doesn't matter whether it's an, you're an engineer student or you're an art student or whatever we are. You know, we have a very broad, broad brush with the groups that we work with. Moving, moving on now, I'd love to introduce our, um, our first guest today, which is Susan Moylan-Cones, who is the founder and director of the Guy Marigold Group. 
So the Guy Marigal Group is an organization that has been established to lead social change and create social impact by bringing together like minds and like spirits. So I had a, a, bit, a, a really nice chat with um, Susan earlier and she sent me through some stuff on her bio and I was just, I've just been blown away by everything I've, I've learned about Susan in the very short time that we've uh, been, very, very short time that we've been connected. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about Susan's background to help um, I guess, kick, kick off the conversation. So Susan's ancestry is from, as we know, uh, one of the oldest surviving living cultures on this planet. She is a Wollonga Gurindiji woman from the Northern Territory and was taken at birth from her parents who were also removed as part of the former government policies. The children are now known today as the Stolen Generation. Today, Susan uses her expertise to work with mainstream organizations and communities in the provision of cultural inclusion strategies and immersion sessions, as well as social planning processes. She is one of the founding board members of the PTSD Australia New Zealand, Phyllis Outreach Organization, as well as many community committees in the North Sydney region and board member of New South Wales Indigenous Chamber of Commerce. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, for Reconciliation Week and sharing with us um, your experience personally, but also through the business that you've been, you've found and you've been running um, for the last few years. So to kick us off, Susan, what does, I guess, how do you, how do you feel, what does it mean, the theme of this year's Reconciliation Week being more than a word, reconciliation takes action. What does that, I guess, mean or what does that manifest for you? Um. Thank you for having me. I, I would like to start by saying Waromi Nagaya Susan, Nagaya Grinji Wawunga, Gumida Biyanga, Gumida Waranga, Madamarong Tianaga Anaga, Madamarong Balia, Wallamadagal Guri Pemel. So what I said was, hello, I'm Susan. I'm Grinji Wawunga. I ask with honour and respect permission from the male spirits and the female spirits to be able to talk and to zoom in. Um, on the, the lands of the water Walla Madigal people. Um, so I, I thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, those words were gifted to me by Professor Dennis Foley, who is a Gamaragal man and um, speaking the, the Sydney language. And, and of course, I come from the Northern Territory, so it's not my language. So I want to acknowledge everyone that's on the call and all the different nations that you're zooming in on and, and that I'm on Gamaragal land zooming in to this great conversation about reconciliation and and it is it is more than a word and the for, for first nations people there is um there is such a long history and emotion that gets tied up into that process that we call reconciliation and it does take action we can't just continue to speak words around what this means for people and for communities, because the more that we talk, the more that there is inaction, um, the more that time gets away from us. And there is such injustice for our people. And while we're taking our time, people are dying. And, and we continue to, to mine the mother, Mother Earth, on, on our homelands and countries and the way that we are living on this planet, living on this continent, we, we can't continue to do. So we do need to take action. We do need to learn from each other. And whether we like that word reconciliation or not, it, it speaks of a process. And hopefully that process is about partnerships and relationships and connections. So when we do that through, through the connections that we can make, then hopefully the actions will come and there'll be meaningful actions and we can achieve some great things as opposed to continually having to advocate for who we are as First Nations people of this land. And, and I think that, you know, when, when we talk about us as the original people here, we are the oldest living culture on the planet. And that is something to celebrate. And it is something that we should all be proud of as Australians. So yeah, I, I think that, um, that reconciliation can 
kickstart something um, and that it needs to be more than words and it has been going on for the best part of 30 years. So I guess I challenge the words of what have we been doing? What can we do differently? What does that look like? And will we recognise it when we arrive <laughs> at whatever that destination is? So we, we need to be we need to be really clear on, on what we're doing in terms of this process of reconciliation. Mm. So true. I think uh, that's, that's a really, really um, great concept to, to, um, to think about, particularly we've, we've, we've been work this is, you know, this isn't a new thing for us to work on, but yeah. what's, what do we, what's, what can we do to ensure that things do change into the future? And one of the things that we spoke about um, earlier before um, the set this session now um, that particularly struck me was some of the the, the concepts of um, that the Western frameworks in which we actually um, you know facilitate business or we um, you know the, I mean those those concepts that sort of bind us in our society that are so ingrained in us um, and yeah. there are alternatives that um, we can we can look look at implementing and learning more about that may may hold some of the may hold some of the answers there. Did you want to yeah. share a bit more on that? Thanks. <laughs> we, we had a we had a really lovely conversation this morning. And and one of the things that in in terms of the fact that we are the original people of this land, the fact that there was an original economy, there were original land management and water management systems. There were human rules of behavior in terms of kinship. So there's a whole raft of cultural principles that are ancient and, and you know, they are a part of our DNA and our ancestry on this land. So when, when we had a, another system from the Northern Hemisphere be transplanted on top of of a system that already worked, that then got squashed and not heard, that those, those ways of being and understanding and, and the functionality that's an ancient system is needed today. It's applicable today. It's still relevant today. And I, I think that, you know, in terms of my business and, and when I left, you know, paid employment, <laughs> at the ABC and, and NITV previously where I used to work in broadcasting. And, and I started my own company. And you know, whilst that's a scary thing, um, it freed up my thinking and it freed up my ability to do things from my cultural standpoint and from my viewpoint and how I wanted to run a business that was unencumbered by this Western construct and system. And that was really freeing. And I didn't, I didn't really register that when I started out on the journey of, of, you know, creating a company that would do things that were meaningful to me. And it was really the way in which I, I, I realized that I live in two worlds. Um, I have my cultural background and context and then being part of the stolen generation and, and growing up in Sydney and, and being raised in a non-Indigenous family and, and what that brought to, to my consciousness and way of being, that I, I straddled both. And I then had to make sense of both of those worlds in terms of the business that I was creating and then running. And it just was, a different way of seeing how to do things. So I'm, I'm all about empowering others around me. So whilst, whilst there is an element to which I want the business to be successful, money is not my motivator. Mm. And, and that challenges a lot of people when I do business with them, because to a certain extent, I go, I don't care about the money. <laughs> like, I, I want to agree on these points because these are the things that are gonna keep me engaged or I will just simply walk away. And, and if it's not about empowering our people, healing our people, allowing organizations to see what they're doing and how they might be able to, to be flexible 
in their business principles and practices, they're the things that will keep me engaged or allow me to walk away. Mm. Because if I can't see that the way business is operating in this country and it's not going to empower us as the original people, as the sovereign people of this land, to give us some sense of engagement in the economy, engagement in business, then I don't want to be involved because I don't want to be a part of the the continuation of keeping our people down. I I want to facilitate voice. And and that was a part of the role that I was playing within the ABC and NITV. It was always about facilitating voice. It was always about the narrative and presenting people and what was important to them from across the country um, to tell their story and, and tell us who they are. And, and, and there is a lot of beautiful things about who they are. There's a lot of beautiful principles that would make a difference in mainstream to be more sustainable on the planet whilst people are running businesses. I just, I did, well, I did have a question and it was sort of floated in my mind when you, when, you know, when you talk to those groups about, and say, I'm not interested in the money and they kind of, they flip out. What, are, how do you, how do you, I guess, manage when like the, the clash that happens between having this, what is, I guess, a bit of a unique way of approach to business when you do sort of come up back in, in you know, you're trying to do business with groups that are very you know that traditional western mindset still yeah how do you because we're talking we're talking about we're talking about the commercial commercialization yeah and we and and that more often than not in terms of business gets framed around money and yeah. finances and when you flip that narrative and it flips people out like it freaks them out yeah. um and and i you know Money means different things to different people. Different amounts of money, so what we value and and how much monetary value we place on something, um, that's different to different people and different businesses and organisations. So um, for me, like I always get a bit of a giggle about it um, because for me, I have a sliding scale. And whilst everyone kind of doesn't understand how my business works or is successful because of the way that I operate. Um, So I will say to to big organizations, you know, um, just give me the sliding scale within your budget, like like what's reasonable to you. And and then with community groups and and different individuals, like I I know that money is tight, so then I'll do it for free. So so it is that mentality of, you know, you take from, it's the Robin Hood stuff. Mm. You, you, you take from Peter to pay Paul sort of thing. And, and it really, for me, it works. And, and I'm, you know, I'm grateful to, to spirit um, to allow me to function in this way because I, I'm not sure that it does work for other people. Um, I'm not sure if it's because of the way that I, I do it and speak it and walk it that it... Um, like I attract a certain amount of business or person to to me, which then allows me to do the dance, so to speak. Um, and people, I've actually said no to lots of money and people almost like just look at me like I'm mad going, what do you mean you don't want to do this? It's because it doesn't align with my principles and, and it doesn't, it's not the right thing for Indigenous people of this land. So I simply won't do it. Um, And that sometimes is really challenging for people. So, you know, we're we're in Reconciliation Week and there there are all these organisations that are signing up to Reconciliation Action Plans. And and they think that that's the solution to all their problems and and the nation's problems. And it's, you know, we've, we've had 30 years of reconciliation and we've come a certain way down the path, but in terms of the recognition, we are 3% of the population. We are the sovereign people of this land. There is still fundamental issues in how we have this relationship on this landscape. And we need to do the unfinished business. Why is that so hard? 
Why is it that successive governments, and even now when we're talking about everyone's jumping on the bandwagon of the Uluru Statement from the heart, that's gonna be another 30 years of keeping us really busy, probably not progressing as to where we wanna go. So for me, it's looking at how far can we get with what we're doing? Who's benefiting? Who's, who's constructed the game? And who's making up the rules along the way? So being a public servant in broadcasting, working for the ABC, NITV, there was a whole lot of rules around how I had to conduct myself. When I created my company, guess what? I was making up the rules. And I can walk into companies and, and I walk into some pretty big institutions in this country and I just ask the question, why? Why are you doing this? What is it about doing a reconciliation action plan or signing up to the Uluru Statement? What do you think that's about? And what difference will you make in your organization? How does this benefit First Nations people? Do you have a relationship with the community that surrounds the organization that, you know, the place that you're operating from? And if it's not, why not? If you're not making a difference in people's lives that have had, you know, breaches of their human rights in terms of being stolen, um, you know, a sorry day yesterday, that's always a day that, you know, is of mixed emotions for me as someone from the stolen generations. People are still learning about these parts of our history that are uncomfortable truths. So when people wanna sign up and just do the fun fluffy bits at the tail end and not go back, not understand how we got to this point, not really knowing the foundational issues that were there, like the land was stolen, the children were stolen. This whole thing is just one big delusion. And we need to continue to set the story straight, to tell the truths of this land and our history. So then everyone together in a hopefully a solid relationship can do business differently. So money doesn't motivate me. People's intentions and people's actions motivate me. And then once I see an alignment and they really mean what they say and they start to step into the action, then I will do business with them. I love that. I, I, I have a thousand other questions I wanna ask you, but I know we're running out of time. So I will throw to the, the, or the, 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 the audience. Does anyone on the Zoom have a question they're dying to ask? <laughs> and if you, you can just, if you'd like to, you can just jump off mute and ask it. Everyone's very shy. Everyone's really shy. They're Seriously. welcome to type it into the chat section too. There's a you couple can, of statements that have gone in there as well. I um I just wanted to I think the the work that you 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 do in when you identify groups that you do work with, um, and when I think about the, you know, that is, that's, a, that's an important piece for any business to be able to stand, be able to say, you know what, I can lie in bed straight at night because I'm doing business with groups that share the same ambitions as me and have the same ethical principles as yeah. me. And that can be a difficult thing to, um, to, to learn. And it's a very hard lesson to learn. Um, when you don't get it right. And and look, I, I'm aware that money makes the world go round, that we do operate with money. And, and I guess I'm grateful that people want to engage with me and and do work with me. And it's it's something that I do pinch myself because you know, I, I have been involved with, with the Indigenous Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'm, I actually don't sit on the board anymore. I sit on, on other boards. Um, so you know, share the love around, right? <laughs> um, but it's, it's really, it, there are things that 
I won't compromise. And, and I think that because I've held myself in a certain way, being, being a company and doing the work that I do, that it's, it's put me in a certain place that now people are starting to recognise. And fundamentally at the core of what I do is cultural. And, and I, I walk a cultural line. Um, people ask me for advice from a cultural opinion and, and I, I, give, I give some stuff away because I think that, you know, it's, it is a give and take. It is that reciprocal behaviour and understanding and ways to relate to each other that, that we do need to get back to. But it's also there is a value in, in who we are as First Nations people. Yep. There is so much untapped potential and a value add to business when we come at it from an indigenous standpoint. And when, when the Western system understands that view and that lens, and that it gets incorporated into the Western dominant structure of business, that's when we're gonna see things start to change because you know, in terms of living sustainably on this planet, we can't keep doing it the way that we're doing it. And it is about the fact that as adults and, and you know, young adults and old adults, we are borrowing the planet from our children and our grandchildren. So we need to do this better. We need to set a better example for how to live sustainably on this planet because otherwise there's not going to be much left. Mm. When my unborn grandchildren grow up to be adults. So um, it's about me walking my talk. It's about me sharing my knowledge. It's about doing business, but on my terms, which are cultural terms. Excellent. I, I had sure. a, did have a question. Um, I wanted to know with your experience um, of bringing the Indigenous perspective to people that have never been in contact with it, could you give us some examples of when you've seen their light bulb moment to borrow Oprah Winfrey's term? But <laughs> is, is there a time that you, and I, I could imagine you get so much joy from this, but actually seeing someone's eyes light up and they actually understand it for the yeah. first time? So um, I was sharing this morning that I've co designed a unit in another university's MBA course. And we took them on country and we gave them time around the campfire to talk about business and business practices and looking at it from an indigenous standpoint. And the light bulb moments throughout the course in the classroom and then on country and the fact that that healing um, ability when you are in the bush and on country, it, it speaks, you know, volumes to, to the way as humans we function in this world. If we're constantly in classrooms, if we're constantly in offices, if we're constantly inside, then that whole ability to connect to something greater than us that empowers us and nurtures us and gives us energy, we're, we're disconnected from it. And when I see, and, and I, I wanna cry half the time. Um, so I'm, I'm sitting around a campfire listening to these wisdoms from elders, knowledge holders, um, seeing the faces, just these light bulb moments and being able to articulate how that has changed them both um, physically, mentally, and, and just the way of being in the world, that's the work that I like doing. Because then, you know, then you have opportunities to plant seeds that then go and grow in another garden. And, and sometimes those, those plants, those flowers will get to blossom because they can influence, they're in a position of power to influence an organisation or you're sending them out and that organization is not mature enough to get it. And so then there might be a floundering, but even if we've changed one person and, it's, and it doesn't work in the workplace, but it works for them, then we've changed that life that will then go and do something somewhere else in the future. So that, that's what 
that's worth a million bucks to me. And, and when I see these, these beautiful human beings um, having their life changed and, and how grateful they are for the experience, like I love that. And it just, it, it nurtures me and keeps me going. Well, thank you very much for sharing that, Susan. I really appreciate it. And yeah, it is a true um, gift and satisfaction when you can actually see that you've yeah. changed someone's perspective on, on life. Um, and, and in such a meaningful way from um, the most ancient culture that we have on this earth. Uh, yeah. We actually have got a question from Fanique, uh, Monique here. So do you think Western companies can get to healing country rather than diminishing it? Oh, look, you know, I, <laughs> wouldn't that be amazing? And, and I, I look at some country, companies and I ask questions of some companies. What does it mean to you when you fly the flag? What does it mean to you when you put a plaque in the door? What does it mean to you when, you know, there's stickers outside banks or outside big shopping centres because they have reconciliation action plans? You're actually admitting to the fact that there are original races of people that were here before. So what does that mean and what is the next step? And how do you then be a party to creating and doing something different? Because if we understand that we are the sovereign people, if we understand the land was stolen and something was built on top of our land, mainstream is now acknowledging the original people of land. So then what is the logical next step? And, and I don't think we can continue to wait for government to show leadership here because clearly they're not. And we've had three prime ministers just recently reject the notion of the Uluru Statement. And, and the only part that I'm interested in is when are we getting to treaty? And I hope to influence big corporates, companies, institutions to actually taking the role of leadership. And you know, when when we when we know that government will do what the government does, which is protect itself, and it does sign allegiance to the crown, all of those politicians in our government. So I would hope that smart people, people with compassion and empathy that sign up to reconciliation, then can take the next step. And look, the Victorian government and other governments, um, state governments are starting to look at the truth and reconciliation, that they're looking at, at, um, at treaties. I just don't know how, how we can treaty when we are Australian citizens. Because what John Howard said was we cannot treaty with ourselves. And he was correct. How do we as sovereign nations treaty with the Commonwealth government and that's the key. So just my last little drop of wisdom in there, because I will stop now, <laughs> is have a look at what the sovereign Yudinji nation is doing. So that land is what's commonly known as Cairns and there are the, the Yudinji sovereign people who have re-established their nation, their government, and they're, they're currently negotiating with the Commonwealth. So they are not Australian citizens. They are your dingy sovereign nation citizens. And they're, they're, they're doing it very differently. So have a look, see what's going on there. Because wow, you, you, you won't hear it in mainstream media. Yeah, I haven't heard anything about that, but that's, just, that's really... Um... Yeah, disruptive to, to borrow a term from um, the innovative playbook. Yeah, very <laughs> disruptive. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, you've got to come at things from a different angle, haven't you? You can't just keep, you know, banging your head against the brick wall and expecting a different result, yeah? Yeah. Well, thank so, you very much for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, being a part of our event today um, and as you as you part is it, what's the best way for people to um connect with you um outside of this event if they would like to continue the conversation oh look more than happy to so um i i'm happy for you to pass on my email if 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 you're happy to do that yep. um 
or I will also just type it in the in the chat as well. But if people, oh, if I can do that, I'm so hopeless with Zoom. Um, let me see if I can do that. Um, but, but we can also uh, pop it in. Look at you go. <laughs> and the writing is so small, I haven't got my glasses on. Let's see if that worked. There you go. Oh, yep, that looks perfect. Right. First time. And, and more than happy for people to um, reach out and ask questions. Excellent. Susan, thank you so much. My really pleasure. appreciate you making the time to be here with us today again. Um, and uh, yeah, wish you uh, a lovely rest of your week and weekend and looking forward to seeing you here in the incubator soon. Yeah, that would be great. So I just, you know, thank you everybody for having me and, and for listening. Um, I'll hang around for another 20 minutes, but I do have to dive off to another event at one o'clock. So, so lovely to meet you all and, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much. All right. So we, um, that, was, that was an amazing session, wasn't it? Uh, let's move on. Got James is off screen. He's very shy, but um, he enjoyed it thoroughly. <laughs> Moving on, we've got our second speaker is Les Delaforce. I think Les is on the line. Are you? Yep. Are you there? He's yep. with me. Sure am. Yep. There you are. Hi, Les. Hi, hey, hey Morgan. How are you going, mate? Yeah, good. Now, have we met before? <laughs> I read your LinkedIn message before. Where there's somehow a connection with my previous co-founder uh just an absolute small world back in i Perth. saw it this morning and thought geez how did i how did i miss this um anyway this is a, right it's a long story we could talk about that um, <laughs> offline um thanks so much for joining us i just want to do a, a brief intro for you if that's all right les yeah just to, just to kick us off so um uh les is the indigenous entrepreneur director at mindaru foundation board director of startup wa and non-executive director of Helping Minds. Les is an experienced founder, board director, and advisor to startups. At One Generation, Les leads the indigenous entrepreneurship stream with a focus on investment, education, and research. Well, you've come to the right place, Les. Um, <laughs> a proud Kumbanji man and a 40 under 40 winner in 2020, Les built DreamSpark and Covocate, the first indigenous startup to raise venture capital, scaling internationally with teams in Israel and Canada in an exit in 2019. Amazing. Thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> Cheers, Morgan. Uh, thanks for having me, mate. Yeah, really, really excited to be here. And especially, and Susan as well, listening to Susan's, it just, it just gives you tingles down your spine. Just as so, uh, it's, it's really inspiring. So. so is there anything I missed in that, um, that intro? No, that's all. Yeah, it's, I guess as mob, you know, you sort of feel a bit shame when uh, in front of everyone and listening, some of, listening to some of those things. But I guess it's, you know, having a three-year-old daughter now, it's, I guess it's something that we all should be proud of as well and celebrate our acknowledgement, our achievements. And, uh, but yeah, I think it's predominantly covered. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, so you're originally from Kempsey. Yes. Yep. Kempsey. Now you I mean, I know you're in New South Wales at the moment, but you're you're living in you 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 relocated to WA. You've always had strong connections to your people in the land, and we'd like to know a little bit more about what it was like growing up, bring yeah. growing up from where where you're from, and and some of the I guess um, what inspired you, and also yep. what are some of the you know some of the things that maybe frustrated you. Sure, absolutely. Um, well, firstly, yeah, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which I stand. Uh, uh, usually is uh, Wajak Noongar people of the Noongar Nation in Perth and has been for the last 18 months. But being here in Sydney, first time ba being back home in New South Wales on Gadigal land. So I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past and present and emerging leaders um, Gadigal country. So, and especially for those uh, I'm virtually on this meeting, on, on this call as well. But for me, uh, growing up in Kempsey, New South Wales, and then moving to Port Macquarie, it was, I had a really strong upbringing with family and uh, with culture as well about what's important about how to, it's not just how to benefit yourself, but how to create impact for community. So for me, growing up, it was organising homework centres uh, for young mob. So we went to Westport Primary School, across the road was a commission home. So a lot of mob, a lot of family weren't going to school. So it's like, how do we, rather than the uh, education department trying to plug the gap, 
what could I do as a 16 year old uh, Kuri and just try and, and help overcome some of those challenges. And yeah, 16 years old, I organized the uh, July Homework Center in Port Macquarie then when I was living in Port Macquarie. And uh, yeah, it was for a young mob to come along, um, they get a feed, have one-on-one -on -one mentoring, uh, had sports attached to it and started uh, effectively mentoring at that young age at 16 with our local member, which is Rob Oakshaw when he was a local member before he came an independent and a bit of a power broker with the Commonwealth government a few years ago, obviously with the election. So yeah, spent most of my life in Port Macquarie uh, and then flew across to Perth 12 years ago. Amazing. And so, so now you're in WA, what drew you to, um, to the other side of the country? It was either Sydney or Perth and Perth felt very much like a, a big Port Macquarie, a big Kempsey. And it was just the, that laid back uh, attitude uh, close to the beach and also didn't have the problems with traffic. So I thought I'd go across there and I've never been to Perth, um, flew across and I love coming to Sydney, uh, especially around state of origin time, family down here, family in New, uh, Newcastle, uh, we're all up there on the uh, East coast of New South Wales. And uh, yeah, so I flew across to WA and just and loved the place. Uh, met my well now wife over in WA and it just felt like a nice place to to try and grow into a, a career. I was unsure what to do. It was, for me, it was really important to follow my passion. And that, I guess that's such an overused word that passion is hallucination without action. So if you're passionate about something, go out and create that change. So in Port Macquarie, I became a cadet accountant. And hopefully for those on the call, there's not too many accounts, but I didn't enjoy the profession. I wasn't passionate about it. But I wasn't going to jump online and, and just to say, I'm really passionate about something, like something and walk away. So what, what action do I need to take to create change? Those values that were instilled into me uh, growing up by my parents. So <laughs> flew across to WA, uh, worked in the WA public sector, uh, some of the departments like corrective services, and I've spent about seven years there, uh, creating programs for offenders and prisoners. Uh, of pre-release and post-release programs and, and, and try and identify job opportunities for prisoners. And that's where we yeah, came up with an initiative with Generation One. So I'm a long involved, um, involved with Generation One in different various roles. So yeah, 12 years in WA. Oh, that is so interesting. Um, and particularly um, with what I know about um, Covercate and um, what that business sought to do, which was to create equity in the hiring process and um, building, you know, ensuring we had the right, actually the best candidate rather than the biases that can become so prevalent in the hiring process and everything else. Is that, I guess, did your experiences across those different sectors and, and, um, and with those different programs help, I guess, shape that idea or, or, or where did you, where did you come yeah. up with that idea? No, that, absolutely. That's a really good point. That's, and it came purely from working in the public sector. I would see that the you know there was a lot of really well-intended uh, people that work in the sector, uh, in for government, but it was not necessarily the right people in the right roles getting to to jobs. Really technically brilliant, but then when it came to the right values, right fit the managerial um, sort of skills, I guess lacked. But for for us, it was then identifying well, a lot of us, or well, fourteen percent of us have a tertiary qualification. So when you receive 300 applications in HR, the easiest way to screen out applications is just to, when you've got so much on your place, go tertiary qualification, screen out, screen out, screen out. Uh, gaps in employment, um, like my wife, like going off and, and, and giving birth and having a, a two daughters now, that gap in employment. So it's just the same people getting the same roles. And Darren and I, a colleague of mine, which obviously we've just found out this morning, Morgan, that we both know coincidentally, just yeah, on the other side of the country, we, we said there's got to be a better way. But rather than complain about it and not do anything about it, let's take it into our own hands. So we built a startup and we uh, effectively is an early stage candidate screening tool. So it would remove unconscious bias. We built a set of algorithms and I had never been in startups before. So build a set of algorithms that would identify individuals' values that's aligned to the role that they're going into. And... But we made a lot of mistakes 
building it, but we found though, it was a semi-automated process, build an MVP. And then once we found it started to scale, then I engaged a CTO or a dev to come in to, to help build the platform. So rather than individuals going through hundreds of applications, we built the software that would effectively, candidates would undertake 24 nuance based questions and screen them and rank them in terms of compatibility to the role. But the important thing of what that did is that it removed that unconscious bias. So we saw more Aboriginal people getting employed, more women getting employed, people with disabilities, people with called backgrounds getting employed as well. I remember when Darren told me that he uh, was making the move from um, full-time gainful employment to working on this, uh, starting this business um, with uh, not a lot of capital behind him. I thought, mm -hmm. I, I have to admit, I thought it was crazy. But when he showed me the, the idea of what you guys were doing, um, like it's really hard to argue with that as uh, as a product so i'm curious to to know what where were you at the time when you made the decision to actually go from you know gainfully you said you're in the public service most people get a job there and never want to leave again mm -hmm. you um you uh, you made that decision to leave that and and um start a tech a tech business um what yeah, where were you at and what was the i guess what was the main driver to sort of make take that leap of faith uh, it was looking back now, it's uh, not having kids back then probably helped as well. But uh, there was a, a kid on the way. It was uh, at, right at that point in time, it was when, once we started delivering, we started seeing companies uh, access the, the software online um, all over the world. We thought maybe we're under something here. Uh, but I went to what was called Mara, the Mara Masterclass at Melbourne Business School. And that in there being around 23 other like-minded uh, mob and they gave me the instilled in me that confidence to go out and do it and take that leap we failed the first round trying to raise angel investment and with uh perth melbourne and brisbane angels uh so what we did we came back we went and they wanted to see skin and skin in the game so how do we then try and uh, so you've got to throw in that take off that security blanket and you know a, a secure public sector job level seven over there like this is, you know, live comfortably, but I'm like, no, this, we're creating impact and the excitement that rush. So I've got to, to um, Mara, their second uh, cohort and then, um, or block, came back to Perth, said to my wife, look, I've just resigned from my public sector job. And she's like, great, what are you going into? And our startup, she's like, that's not generating really any revenue, is it? Like, no, no, but we'll be fine. So it was 12 months then and no income. My wife was six months pregnant and it was a, lesson in diplomacy that's for sure and um so we were and it got to the point where we were we had teams as we said before in israel and canada and we were two weeks away from losing everything and it was to the stress was unbelievable but we felt as though we had something we saw that opportunity the traction so we came to sydney we, we tried in perth we couldn't there's a lot of money in perth but it mostly goes into junior mining exploring uh, explorers so we came to sydney melbourne singapore uh, trying to raise capital and then eventually yeah we were we didn't know at the time but we were the first indigenous start to raise venture capital out of here out of sydney and it was a a huge milestone for us and not only because we we didn't lose everything my wife and i but it allowed us then to scale but it was just it, it was a weird feeling just to take that security blanket off dive in head first no income for a, a long period of time but use all of my Long, uh, long service leave, my um, annual leave uh, from the public sector to help fund us as much as possible. But it was just, just some pretty dark days and pretty scary, but we eventually came out in the end and started to scale the, the, the startup. And, uh, and I noticed actually, I noticed on the chat, we've got some other Amara alumni on, uh, on there as well. So uh, that's, that's brilliant to see. You've got a fan club online. <laughs> uh, what I wanted to, I, what I did want to ask you was in the middle of all that, on that journey upwards, you snagged some pretty big clients, didn't you? Yeah, we, uh, it was, and now that we found out just this morning uh, that Morgan and I know like mutually uh, Darren, which is the, the other co-founder of Covacade, and it was just by coincidence, that's how we know each other by extension. So it's great that you've got some background of the story as well. And, um, but yeah, we, we pitched it to Roy Hill Mining and, it was at a, at a point in time in the GFC here and they were trying, they were saying they can't compete with the T1s like your Rio's and BHP on price of iron ore. 
But what we can do is create, try and create a competitive advantage by using tech as that mechanism. So we went in there and it was really interesting because we did a, a six month pilot, a small pilot. It was at a point in time where they decided, and it's public now, but when we were working on it, it wasn't public. So we worked with their steering committee uh, building this platform, but recruiting people based on values. So they believe if we hire for will, train for skill. If we get the right people in with the right values, we can train them up because there are a lot of people coming with the wrong values. So they weren't re- for 12 months. They didn't recruit anyone with a mining background in a mining company. They were going to wedding expos, Netball Australia. And so they took a big gamble on us. So it was up to us. And um, at that stage, it was the four of us. And uh, we grew by an extra two. Then um, against Chandler McLeod and a huge multi-million dollar or billion dollar company. It was four, four of us against uh, then taking them on. We're like, we're not, we're not going to win. And we eventually won out. And that was our first big client. And, uh, and then we eventually rolled it out across the entire organization, across Raw Hill Mining. And we saw, we, we used their data. So we engaged their, their data. We saw more Aboriginal people being employed by using our platform. So not by having targets or quotas there, but using the platform right at the very start to help inform their recruitment process. So more mob as a result. Then this, I'd probably say the second, the next one was just pro bono. We did that. With the NDIS, we help this. I help support the recruitment of eighty-five thousand staff into the sector, and it was free for all of the national disability services organisations, the thirteen hundred member organisations across the entire country to access. But we thought, if we're passionate about diversity, and this is a you know a sector that needs a lot of support, a lot of help, and it's at a time where. There was a lot because it was $45 billion going into the NDIS. There were a lot of people trying to milk the, the, the system, but we went in with the right intentions and went, you know what, we're going to provide this for free and then help support the sector. So, it was, so that was 12 months of working on that with the NDIS. But to see our logo next to the Commonwealth crest, the state crest all around the country was, was pretty exciting. Mm, wow. Um, in the middle, in the midst, so in the midst of all of that, um, and um, I was wondering, was there any any unique challenges specific to being an Indigenous founder at that time? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. That's where I had this last night in Sydney, actually. We were talking to, uh, there was a couple of journos and asked the same question. And and look, at, at the time, there were the conversations around, okay, so you're from Kempsey. What happens if you're going to spend all our money on, on alcohol? So you must fight then and uh, that you're from Kempsey. So this is with very high net worths in Sydney. And but I always found using educational advocacy as that uh, mechanism to try and spin around rather than going, you racist so and so. It was just, uh, it was really surprising that those comments are still there. Um, yeah. And even that, look, you don't look Indigenous. And then it became an education session of, uh, you know, Aboriginal people have an atypism gene, so a recessive gene doesn't throw back. And this is, you know, it's almost like a history lesson at the start before you pitch. And it was, it, you became, tiresome and that was only five years ago and it, and it felt like we were diversity five years ago wasn't a thing it was we were educating the market about why diversity is really important this is with a lot of large corporates but diversity is everywhere now but it was a big challenge that we had about this, why this is important then the mckinsey report around diversity how that uh improves an organization's bottom line by 30 percent that was a catalyst i think globally and now we're seeing diversity is a really it's a critical thing but Right at that early stage, we had, you know, we had those comments. We had investors. We had one investor at 780K. You know, look, if you get rid of this, the little diversity tag, we'll, we'll invest. We're just here about ROI and about how we can improve hiring. Um, and this streamlines the recruitment process, but drop that little diversity tag. And so we, it, that was around the time when we were running out of money and we had needed to raise. And so it was that conversation at the board level do we what do we do do we go against everything like my upbringing about our values and also the organization's values or do we do we say no and we we stood we had a really good chairman cheryl edwards and we we said no we said no and it was hard like you that's as a young founder startup seeing that money there and you're like wow imagine that hitting the bank account you could scale but it went against our value proposition and we we walked away wow that um, I, I don't know if you were on the line before when Susan uh, Moylan uh, was was talking about um, some of her experiences and um, 
It was yeah. Yeah, it, talking about that that ability to say no to yep. to the wrong fit, and for you that would have been incredibly hard. You're, such a, you're in a real position of weakness there. Yeah, and you certainly come back stronger. And that was the uh, born in Kempsey. Like I, I've never been in these types of boardrooms here in Sydney. You know, behind me in Martin Place, and with very and some prominent names in there as well. Some very high net worths across Australia, and it'd be like, "Hi, Mister Such and Such. Hi, Mister." And then I'll you know walk away, and I went coming back now after that happening to us, and then coming back to Sydney, and then raising capital is like, no, I I know we know our value. You know, we are doing a good thing in the market for corporations for organizations but for community like this is having a direct impact for aboriginal people for women for people with disabilities people with cold backgrounds so we were confident that next time going in and go and we would walk away and it was funny because some of those investors are going we want to see that confidence coming in and we see you know some of you and ourselves are being being younger but we came in really confident the second time because we knew our value and we weren't going to be pushed around with those stupid comments like that mm -hmm. And the irony of all of that is that now, fast forward, diversity is oh. such a hot topic. So that same company is probably would be dying if they knew <laughs> that those were yeah. the comments that you got. Um, yeah, exactly. So you've, um, I just wanted to, I guess, move move a bit forward from the from those um, those early startup days to uh, uh, where where you've been working with um, DreamSpark. And um, uh, we know that you've, you know, you've you really made a mission to give back ever since the the work the work that you did do um, in the Myra program. So, did you want to give us a bit of, um, I guess, uh, a rundown on, yeah, on, um, DreamSpark and what what inspired that? Yeah, absolutely. It was you know, after exiting Covacate, um, uh, another colleague and I, uh, Ryan Shields, we. Um, it was yeah this program where we went let's spend you know, 12 months of effectively giving back it's a, a purpose over profit business and partner with organizations like twitter and so they would provide you know, laptops about 27 laptops um, to us and then we would build a program around uh, how to uh, around engaging more Aboriginal people into stem um, and into um, like e safety programs uh, and the importance of technology moving forward when 40 percent of jobs are going to be automated in the next 10 years a strong focus on getting young young mob engaged in the tech sector. So we, you know, that cost us money. We didn't ask for any money, but since we exited, it's like, let's go and do something and build something for 12 months and just go out and give back. And it was just, yeah, he's, really, he's an ex-Googler, so his relationships with Twitter and those organisations certainly help. But we partnered with EdConnect uh, and Social Ventures Australia to help scale the program. So the program would go into different schools and at the end of it, uh, you know, that young kid would will be working on that laptop and go, this laptop is yours now. You can walk away with that laptop. But it took, again, another uh, six months of negotiating with Twitter to believe in, like, what we're going to do with all those laptops. But it was sort of funny because it was we'd rock up the airport in, in hoodies, middle of winter in Perth, and all of these sec repurposed laptops from Twitter would rock up. So they'd be like, what's going on with all these laptops here? So we'd, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was really exciting to see, you know, opportunities that we didn't have growing up my parents wouldn't have had it growing up but you know they've undertaken this little course and they walk away with a laptop an apple mac laptop uh, yeah it's just it was really empowering so it was just a lot of that was giving back there was a lot of work around corporate innovation to engage more indigenous uh, companies to work in with indigenous organizations then on the back of that it was mostly the philanthropic work that we did which then led to dream summit uh, a few years later you want to tell us a bit about that that sounds yeah it was it was at a time where um at, at the end of covacate it was just like the challenges i look around and go what other mob have raised capital and who can i call who can i touch base with them seeing how challenging it was and and hearing others like michaela jade and liam ridgeway other pioneers in the space that are, are breaking ground and trying to make it a lot more a level the playing field for Aboriginal people to get into this equity uh, funding space. And so it was working with, um, it's liaising with Indiru Foundation and Generation One and came on and, su and supported the, the role out of that. And that was a small program initially that we're hoping to engage 20 mob there. Uh, and we ended up getting close to 100 uh, Aboriginal startups, Aboriginal entrepreneurs. 
And it was a place where it was connecting the entire, trying to connect the entire indigenous ecosystem around tech and startups and how to grow and scale a business. And at the end of it had seed funding. And what we found is that we, you know, after Covacate, around the end of the cryptocurrency blockchain days in 2017, sort of feels like it all over again now, uh, the way the market is. But it's, we, you sort of feel like it, you, you've walked away from this entity, but we reached back out to like Facebook, Google, uh, Blackbird Ventures, South Sydney Football Club, and they all came on board and then, yeah, donated their time and, and offered up their time to support Indigenous entrepreneurs. So that that was, a, a, yeah, it was a massive program in the end and it really led to, that, that was the catalyst to coming on board at Generation One afterwards. That's brilliant. I'm actually a massive South Sydney Rabbitohs fan in case anyone wanted to know you probably don't um uh i wanted to um i wanted to ask you about just how how important is it to have indigenous representation and diversity broadly in our just in our, e- our australian ecosystem yeah yeah I, I, it's oh, critical absolutely critical it's what we i guess what we found going through uh, um just those general channels of business. I think Susan covered uh, a bit of this as well and it really well, probably in a lot better detail than what I will. I was just, I was just sitting there taking notes from Susan's uh, presentation. It was super impressive. Um, but it's, yeah, what, what we found that the landscape was really changing. It was, especially five years ago, it was still really challenging. I think there has been a lot of progress though. Um, and especially in that tech sector, uh, I think Black Lives Matters really helped push things forward because it was those original VC firms and other you know, larger corporates that were all jumping on Twitter and saying how they're going to um, support it. But they were the same organisations I was speaking to pre-Dream Summit to see if they'd come on board, but weren't necessarily interested. So it was it was hard to see then this, this massive support publicly. And then it was then uh, like now over the last couple of months approaching those same organisations to go, we saw you were really passionate about this. Let's see if you're, you know, prepared to put your, you know, your money where your mouth is, and and um, yeah, and they, they have, they they certainly have, and I think that the landscape has really changed uh, quite dramatically. There's more Aboriginal people in, uh, especially in, in that tech and startup space now coming through. It's a rapidly growing ecosystem, especially when 50 percent of our mobs under under 26 now, we're, but we're more of a consumer technology rather than a creator. So we need to shift. We've got an opportunity right now to shift to become a creator, creator of technology. But we're starting to see some of those larger corporates. Um, and interestingly, a lot of the US tech giants that have really come out and support these initiatives. And I, I still trying to figure out why maybe they've had that, that movement in the US and they've seen how important that was or and is over there. And that's possibly why they're like you Googles and Facebooks, um, Microsoft, uh, that are all supporting these programs that we're running now. But there's, it's the education piece. It's not just asking if they can support us. It's them learning about Indigenous culture. And that's the fascinating thing to see right now is that you see it's a, and I felt that the first time when we ran this event in uh, Perth last year, it's an extension of the uh, Dream Summit, but we saw investors for the first time to go, we don't know enough about Indigenous culture. Can you help us learn? What is an Indigenous business? Why is it different? Uh, and we know that most Indigenous businesses and, and startups have a social impact focus. So going for investment, a return on investment is not going to take five to seven years. It might take seven to 14 years for that to materialise. And so for investors, previously, we're like, we want an ROI or for, for a venture capitalists we, and their investors, we want an ROI in five to seven years. But now we're seeing this shift that to, to learn. We've had like one here in, in Sydney that I met with the last couple of days, TDM Growth Ventures. Um, they've got their foundation, $100 million foundation. And then their first initiative is dedicated on Indigenous startups and Indigenous initiatives in that STEM and um, early venture stage. It's, it's really exciting to where those doors are now opening. And there was a lot of those doors where we were, you know, people like Liam and Michaela and Myself, we're all trying to knock down and, and find those back doors to get into those really key people and have those start those conversations. But in that five year period, and I think it's for me, I would have seen over the last probably 18 months, last 12 months, it's really escalated quite significantly uh, with this new project that we're rolling out now with Generation One. 
the the support and you're talking about South Sydney Football Club as well. We just met with them just before their CEO and um, GM. Uh, so they're yeah, and they do a lot of amazing work. So the 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 support from whether it's South Sydney Football Club, but naturally they do a lot of great work. But other VC firms across the country is is really quite fascinating to see the support. But they're open. They're open about culture. Uh, and they're also open about supporting things like the, you know, the Uluru Summit from the Heart. It's and putting money towards it, not just going, yep, we support it, but here's some funds of actually how we're going to help drive change from a non-indigenous perspective. So for government, it's not just Aboriginal people that have that voice and trying to push and for government to hear. You've got now non-indigenous corporates and venture capitalists all putting money into it and also standing up and going, you know what, government, we stand beside mob here we're coming on this journey as well and that's something that i've definitely seen the, the last pro yeah probably the last 12 months is really could the collaboration key uh, has been really key that's amazing so we're at we're, it so it sounds like we're maybe we're getting to a bit of a tipping point in terms of um those kinds of initiatives gaining support and traction um yeah yeah absolutely without a doubt and listening to south city just before there's a lot of there's a lot of amazing programs there's a lot of in, in, you know, in terms of indigenous programs out there a lot of awesome work that's been done by indigenous startups it's a really it's a really fragmented ecosystem still though so what i mean by that is pockets of amazing work being done by indigenous startups across the country but even in perth there's um streaming there's a an indigenous cryptocurrency based a streaming platform with 350,000 daily users and they've been in perth for the last three years and I hadn't even heard of them. It's a space that I'm in. So it's a really disconnected, fragmented ecosystem, but so much incredible work happening. And we're starting to see that, that yeah, you're right. On, you're on that cusp where things are really starting to come together now. And then the collaboration components, we know it's not just going to be me. It's not just going to be generation one or just individuals doing this. It's how we collectively all come together and then focus all our efforts on, on that collaboration piece. Brilliant. We, we're gonna, we will throw to some questions very soon. I did have a couple more questions for you first. And this one was um, uh, casting your mind back to now, knowing what you know now, after all of all this, this whole journey, going back to when you were, um, you were started out studying accounting, what are, the, what are the skills that you think that Indigenous entrepreneurs, young Indigenous entrepreneurs um, need to be focusing on building if they do want to be successful and, and maybe and, and even beyond that just entrepreneurs in general yeah absolutely i think there's there's two parts it's it's really having the soft the soft skills are absolute key especially getting into the door of these vc firms or whether it's debt funding or even corporate clients it's having the ability to have those relationships and the conversations soft skills especially the way automation is going as well a lot of jobs being automated at the moment but I'd say that that is the absolute key. Like if I was telling my daughter uh, a couple of things to focus on, it'd be definitely the soft skills, those relationships, that, that human element that we all uh, you know, are really strong with. We've, we've got that ability as Aboriginal people to share stories, like sharing our culture, sharing stories has always been a part of our culture and utilising our strengths, knowing our strengths and when to use them. And that's certainly that storytelling component. Um, the other is then jobs of the future. So we know things are changing. Uh, things are, you know, with uh, you know, the, I guess the revolution 4.0, uh, what's happening in tech in that space. What we found with some of these programs like the Dream Venture Masterclasses that we're rolling out, a lot of the applications for these Indigenous ventures have been impacted by COVID. So we know uh, there's a great report by Kinaway, 69% of Indigenous businesses have been impacted by COVID. But there's a predominantly, a lot of these really early stage ventures are shifting and go, how do we then move from bricks and mortar and add a website or add Shopify or an e-commerce site onto this? How do we use tech to our advantage? So just having that understanding, that basic understanding of uh, that horizon, but also um, you don't need to be a developer or a programmer, software engineer. And to get into startups, I came from the public sector, probably the I wouldn't say the least innovative sector, but for individuals to go from the public sector into startups, it's venture capitalists, are, um, that's a really unusual direction to head in. But if you can complement two skills, so especially for younger people going through uni, two skills, whether it's law and engineering or law and computer science, that you've created a niche 
So you're specific, you are known for something as well. So it's not just being uh, laser focused and specialized in one area. You've got more of a broad range uh, set of, of experience and the two diverse moves. So if you can try and pair two together, as I was saying before, like law and engineering or law and computer science or business, uh, then that's that's a way to differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself in the market. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. I hope we've got a few of our students on the line here and they're um, considering what electives they're going to take next semester off the back of that. Um, <laughs> diversifying that skill set sounds like uh, it's the way we need to be heading. So before we kick, get into some questions from the audience, my last question is just really coming back to the theme of this year's National Reconciliation Week. Uh, what does it mean for you personally? For me, it's yeah, it's an important. It's a it's a it's mixed emotions. Like obviously, with what's happened in the past, and you know, I've seen what's happened to my grandfather, and how that's impacted us, uh, yeah, all the way, and the the foundation that my parents have created for us, and uh, and for us to not only just focus on a you know, it's not focusing on yourself, it's about what you can do for you, your community. But for me, it's it's a time for not just Aboriginal people, but for all Australians to um, to learn about Indigenous culture. It's also, it's a way for us to share our stories as well. And you know, some of those are, are sad stories, but it's also with a focus on achievements and success. So highlighting the amazing work that, that Aboriginal people are doing across all different sectors, you know, in health at the moment with COVID, like the challenging situation everyone's being presented with at the moment. And, but also it's, it's still an opportunity of providing understanding, I guess, of how every single one of us can contribute to reconciliation in this country. But it, it comes from that shared ownership of understanding uh, right at that very start. Brilliant. Leslie, thank you so much. We will um, now uh, open up to questions from the audience, everyone on the Zoom. If you have a question and you'd like to type it into the chat, we can read it out. Or if you are feeling um particularly uh what's the opposite of shy i'm unshy you're feeling unshy uh, take yourself on mute and say hi ask your question i guess maybe if i add more while the questions come through that's yeah if there's any indigenous mob on here there's um yeah any mob that have startups or entrepreneur or uh, businesses interested we're running our dream summit, dream venture masterclasses here in Sydney, Brisbane, and Melbourne. So we're, the goal is again, it's not just us. How do we connect with you know, the awesome work Macquarie University are doing? Like it's so inspiring seeing the work that that your university is doing in this space, from the Venture Cafe, uh, and you know the work Ainsley and Mel are doing in the team. It's just, it's yeah, it's how we can sort of come together, get out of and and collaborate. So yeah, I do have a question while we wait um, for anyone else there. Did you meet uh, Russell when you went to South? <laughs> No, no, he wasn't there. But I am going to the, well, pending COVID, obviously, I am going to the game on Saturday night for the Indigenous round. So oh, brilliant. I'll be obviously going for the rabbits. Good on you. Les, it'd be great if you could send through information about um, all the things that you're doing so we can continually promote that in all of our communication um, in our networks here. Um, Macquarie Park is, a lot of people don't know this, but we actually contribute um the second um, largest amount to gdp in the state oh, so we're wow. second behind the cbd we're also the number one postcode for ip registrations in australia so anything that we can help you connect into not just the community around here that the innovators which are our researchers and also our entrepreneurs and our students but anything that we can um, help you make connections with some of the businesses um in the park we have a lot of technology businesses in the park a lot of med tech so anything that we can do to help bridge those connections um please let us know um yeah it'd be great to work with you more closely that would that would be great Mel. this is i was put it in the the, the channel the dream venture uh, dot com uh, you which is the website but for yeah uh, the work we'd love to uh, obviously the work that macquarie uni does the support would be awesome. For us, again, we're not after financial supports. How do we spread the message, uh, work with awesome partners to help scale this entire ecosystem? So we're just one piece in the in the puzzle. Uh, and that's it's just it's helping to build that ecosystem and the work that yeah, MQ do. Uh, also, we've got half of our team that have studied at Macquarie University as well. So there's a few on the call in the team, like Georgia Marshall here in Sydney. She's like, I'm oh, Macquarie University. So yeah, it's um, we'd, we'd love to. 
support and partner. Awesome. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Alice. Can you hear me? Yes, hi, Alice. How are you going? Uh, um, um, my name is Alice. I'm from Schneider um, Procurement Team. And it's very inspiring to see uh, what kind of journey you went through. And uh, I can see you're really passionate about the social enterprise and your business. I was just wondering, what, apart from the, obviously, expand the ecosystem and grow the business and then in, increase your influence, uh, what are the high... Uh, area that you want to focus on for the next few years wow that's a really good oh that's it yeah actually it's a great question that's yeah uh, for me i think there's there's the area around so indigenous art is, is obviously an area of focus for me and seeing a lot of these young ventures come through and um you know and have gone through that and the challenges have been really hard at times but also have been really opportunistic as well have been really exciting really exciting as well i think the stage we're currently at around angel investing is really important because there's we, we couldn't find any indigenous angel investors across the country so you've got an indigenous business here and you know going along that pipeline and that that journey hiring more Aboriginal people then exiting there we can't come back around and complete that circle because we need to become a sophisticated investor. So 2.5 million assets, 250K a year in salary. So, you know, it was up to like, working on programs to help support Aboriginal people to become angel investors. And so now it'll be the first time where Aboriginal people can invest in the next generation of Indigenous startups. So we're not just getting going to a bank, getting a bank loan, walking away or a non-Indigenous investor, and that's nothing wrong with that. We've done that um, and walk away with a mentor. But as an Aboriginal person, you're investing your own money into an Indigenous startup coming through. So that's a really, it's, a, I think, a bit of a movement as well. I would see the that final frontier would be venture capital. So having the ability to build a venture capital fund, and it's specifically an Indigenous venture capital fund, there's a lot of goodwill, goodwill and intent out there. But... For me, that the areas are focused on is around the access to capital. There's been lots of barriers towards accessing capital, you know, the lack of intergenerational wealth, networks and connections, um, also um, yeah, access to networking connections, but also the financial literacy component. But if we can help level that playing field and then open that door and get access to capital is really, is that for me, that really important area. That's a very great answer because it's sustainable as well. That actually will help you to fund the next generation. Absolutely. Yeah, you 100% agree. And that's trying to find out that linear path. It's not just venture capital isn't the answer just here because, you know, there's startups that aren't at that stage and we weren't at that stage. But if we can help circumvent two years of the mistakes that we made to get to this point, then it does that linear path of having absolutely exactly what you said. You've got some programs here, whether it's Dream Summon or the um, what we're doing with the Dream Venture Masterclasses, or there's Nagami that RMIT have the Trade Roots program, Mara, the work at you um, that um, MQ do as well uh, to really capacity build Indigenous startups and ventures to then get to, to that stage. It's a linear process, and it's yeah, it's just, just like a startup. It's going through the MVP and then building it with that ultimate goal at the very end. Thank you, Leslie. Thanks, Al. I think that's awesome. I think we've got a wrap now. Awesome. Thank you very much for your time, um, Leslie, and thanks um, our awesome Morgan for being the, the best host that we could hope for and also having knowledge of the speakers. It was hilarious, the email um the emails that went back and forth uh, between the team as Morgan slowly realised he'd actually met Leslie before and played cards with him well, in WA I, at a pub. I sent, look, I sent Leslie a message this morning saying, hey, we played we played cards before, didn't we, at, uh, at the brewery in Fremantle? Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure whether it was you now. <laughs> yeah, but we, we know that, yeah, it's just... We absolute... definitely both know your co-founder, Darren, who is an amazing human being. Ah, oh, it's well, a small world. I, I can't believe that it's just, yeah, you know, Darren, the, the co-founder of Covacate, who's now in Tokyo, who's now lives in Tokyo with his wife, uh, just to get that message this morning. So it's great to have that knowledge and background that you have with the business. It's just, yeah, 
but um but also thanks to everyone on the on the call as well like listening into your story it's always an interesting time through national reconciliation week to share your story you know is there is that sort of that shame you go through a lot of emotion but it's then just as i say saying sharing stories about how we can come together and collaborate so yeah appreciate the the time with everyone on the call and morgan what a host and melissa as well the opportunity and ainsley Ainsley's jetting off to a, a, a mini um, family break with her kids um, at the moment. And she's um, recently found out she's pregnant with their third child. So wow. great news. It's really exciting. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So well, Anne. But she did send me something she wanted me to, to read out as we wrapped up today. And that was a message she got. And she thought it was quite pertinent to today's event. She wanted me to say it's National Reconciliation Week here in Australia. What's that? It's a time for all people to reflect on reconciliation in Australia. This means non-Indigenous people taking responsibility for building stronger, more respectful relationships with First Nations communities and working harder to build a more united country. One that recognises and centres First Nations people as the sovereign and original people of this place we call home. This week puts a national focus on the learning more about First Nations knowledge, culture and stories and listening to the voices of First Nations people. And I couldn't be happier that we had our First Nations focus on entrepreneurship um, and hoping that this is the start of a really great relationship with Leslie and the Macquarie University Incubator. So thank you again. And thanks for everyone for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank really appreciate it. Macquarie University, Morgan, Melissa, Ainsley. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Peace out. <laughs> awesome. Stay safe, everyone. Yeah. Okay.